Hi, this is Mike. Welcome to the bench. I had an R10.20 carbine that I sold, and the customer wanted me to drop ship it to David Slade and told me that Dave does all his rifles. It would be okay. But I called Dave up and said he doesn't want a rifle drop shipped to him. When I told the owner what Dave said, um, you know, and I told him who I was, by the way, with my YouTube channel and hats and makeovers and rebarrels, he knew who I was through the videos, and he asked me, by all means, Mike, he said, go through the gun. So I put a lot of things together. I thought we would use this iconic gun to do an air gun share, what we found, as well as some air gun basic information. It may be a little long. I'll try to get through it. But for the newbies out there, you may learn something. And for your old-time air gunners out there, you may just like it because it's a Viroc video. So let's get this thing rolling. I do want to say real quick before we get started that I bought a Viroc 97K this year. Basically, after I sold this rifle, I, I sold some others as well and thinned the herd. And I was surprised when it came in 97K and .20. I was surprised when it came because the stock was changed. It was actually nice. I like the, uh, the change of it. So let's get into this. I'm going to try to go through it as quick as I can. So for the new guys out there, one of the things you'll find if you buy a vintage gun is that the air chamber tube is, is the sizes vary. And that's just an R10, but it's an any vintage rifle from Viroc. And um, so you're going to need to find the piston seal that's going to fit that. Now, in this particular build, our piston seal happened to be in between, and we can go into that a little bit later. But if you're going to do a build like this, um, this is a custom setup where we make our own custom guides, and everything about it is custom made. Then you'll gravitate towards a Hornet spring, and that will come from Air Rifle Headquarters. If you go with a full kit, then you can go to Vortec. He has full kits, but you still need piston seals. And by the way, Vortec has changed his kits. He's changed the style of them around. I caught that the other day. And also, Air Rifle Headquarters has full kits, and he has the seals that you'll need to see which one's going to work in the receiver. So here we are with our Hornet Spring from Air Rifle Headquarters. And when you go there and get your Hornet Spring, you'll see Hornet seals here. But don't get confused you got to go by your serial number on the barrel it says right there what the serial number is and that seal is for this serial number and over our serial number fell in way below that by around 300,000. so you'll go to the sgs seals and it's for all these rifles as well this fine print says here ideal for the old r10s and that's what we happen to have but anyway it's also good for these and um, there's two different sizes you can pick from. There's a drop down menu and you'll be on your way. Now, when you get your spring from Air Rifle Headquarters, the Hornet spring is going to need to be set. And it looks like this it's longer because the coils are stretched out. And it's going to need to be set. Now, he'll do them for you for a couple dollars or whatever the price is now. But if you're going to work on your gun, you might as well do it yourself. And you might as well know what the dis difference is before and after and add that to your information of your hands-on build that you've been doing. So when you set the, uh, the spring, um, that's the first thing you have to do before you can get into making custom guides for it. Excuse me a minute, let me take a sip of this water. <clears throat> so there's different ways of doing it. Most guys will put that in their gun and use the factory guide because they have no choice. And then they'll cock it. And everybody's going to be a little different. They'll have their own method of madness that they feel works for them. But I don't do that. I stick it in the gun, but I don't cock the gun. And then I walk away and I leave it. And then I come back when I take it out of the gun. The spring is pretty much set, just like all the other ones. You lose around one and seven eighths of an inch. And at that point, then I make the custom guide for it. Now, the reason I do that for me is because the, uh, the generic spring guide just doesn't fit properly. And I don't want to cock that rifle on a generic spring guide. Now, that's just my own choice. Um, you don't have to do that. But at any rate, what happens is I get the whole build done. And then when I finally go to cock the rifle, 
it'll be cocked for the very first time but it also will be preset follow me and then also will be preset and then being cocked on a custom guide that fits it so either way you do it it's still going to lose initially one and seven eighths inches but at least it's not cocked from the get-go it has a custom guide to fit it and that's why i do it so let's talk about the guide real quick the guide is just that it's custom it's about half inch to five eighths longer and it's a three-piece guide it fits the receiver too like it's supposed to rides right in there hugs the wall just like the metal one did but here we have a nice smooth Delrin guide versus the old clangy spring guide that didn't fit the spring properly. You can see what happens to a spring guide that doesn't fit properly. The spring gets canted and we want to stay away from that. So basically your guide is going to smooth your shot cycle down because when the spring is compressed together and then shot it flings out and because the guide is at a certain um, um, designed to fit that spring it arrests that spring before it goes crazy and it arrests the spring nice and evenly and smoothly and as far as the guide it's a three-piece guide it looks like this and this is the fit you need it's a two-finger pull if you got to use your hand and pry and do everything else then then you made it too tight so if you make your guide too tight you wind up breaking your spring it's supposed to look like this two-finger pull and there it is now you may not be able to tell how snug that is but believe me it's snug enough it's proper and um, that's the way it's supposed to be I just decided to make a little piece of brass for this gun for the bear washer um, and also that needs to be taken down a little bit smaller than the outside diameter of the spring so you have total clearance when the piston comes back and engages with the trigger sear but I, I went with a little bit of brass to give it a little bit of bling because it was an iconic gun and it's an R10. This also comes back and rotates, so you got a lot of things going on with it. And anyway, that's pretty much it, other than you need to make the hole so it fits the piston stem properly. Same thing with the top hat. That hole should be uh, the same, so it's a slip fit, but it needs to be tight on the spring so it can't come off. Now, ironically, in this particular build, some of the things I found was um, got us to a point where, guess what, my top hat came off. So what happened was I was down in there cleaning the piston out, and I didn't have a um, thrust washer or bearing washer at the bottom like this one here that goes with this R9. So I went in my drawer and I got a Vortec bearing washer, and uh, it's as thick as a nickel see it and then i took the diameter down so it would fit nice inside my piston without any problem but i didn't put it in i just had it off to the side because i was getting things ready i was trying to work out my piston seal so i mentioned that we're in between sizes on the piston seal they're color coded from air rifle headquarters yellow is the smallest one Red's the next one that they offer you out of this bunch of the SGS seals. Now, supposedly, the Hornet seal here, which is the bluish purple one, or blue one, um, that's for, like, it's, like it says here, for these numbers and higher, and we were below that. But we happen to be in between sizes, and we ran into some issues. So during the course of checking these piston seals out, I found a little issue going on with the bottom of the piston, and I'll talk about that. Um, basically, I didn't put this in. Now don't remember, don't forget, I didn't have the sleeve off, so it's not like you can see anything going on at the bottom of the piston, other than the fact it didn't have the thrust washer. So I put this one aside, and when I took the gun apart trying to work these piston seals out, I found the problem where the top hat came off, and this is why. Um, see, we can get up there and take a look. I don't know if you can see it. I hope it's I hope it's catching it. But there's the splines on the stem. So those splines um, basically ate my top hat for launch. Okay. Now, if I would have had this nickel-sized bearing washer in, um, we would have been fine and dandy because there wouldn't have been enough splines to to grab anything. See that? 
So I show you this because some of you guys uh, work on your guns and you know, you say, hey, I know about them splines. I worked on a lot of these old vintage rye rocks. But with anything else, it's not so much as you know, and that's great if you do know these things. But when you're actually going through the build, it's what you remember to do. Because it's very easy to go, well, geez, I forgot all about that. So whatever you did in your gun, you may want to think back. Because it would be a shame if you went through all this trouble and then your top hat's getting all chewed up. So it's food for thought. Now I took apart a modern R9 piston. And that's different. It's a little bit different. The splines are a lot finer and they're not as tall. Let's see if we get in there and take a look at that. I gotta wait for the camera to catch it. So once you have the sleeve in there, let's see where we need to be here. Maybe I don't know. Once you have the sleeve in there and the little bearing washer, uh, what's going on down here with the splines wouldn't affect you. So now as far as piston seals go, the yellow one was way too small. The red one was up to bat. Now the red one had a wiper. And if you look, I didn't measure it, but if you look, they look like they're pretty much even to me. I could measure, but I'm not going to. We're just going to waste some time. So since you have a wiper like this on this seal and it looks fairly even across each other, uh, instead of taking a face of seal down, I always say that for the absolute last thing in a gun. I don't like taking seals down if I don't have to. So I decided to take the wiper down, stuck it back in the gun, and next thing I know, the uh, piston seal didn't even fit properly. So it was useless. Well, now what do you do? Now, I was going to order another red one, think, thinking uh, maybe it's old, who knows. But um, at the same time, Air Rifle Headquarters was out of stock on them. So I had the blue one sitting here, and that's not supposed to work according to the serial numbers. But by golly, we're certainly going to sit here, and we're going to try it. Now, this particular blue seal is a Hornet seal, and I have a couple left over from several years back. And uh, so they're not currently current made, but you can actually see if that's supposed to be the wiper. Um, and I don't think it is. It's just probably the design was left in the system because um, it's nowhere near the same size as the face of that piston. I'll try to bring it in so the camera picks it up. You can see the taper from here going down. See if you can see that. Get a little closer, maybe. So at any rate, I knew that wiper on this one wasn't going to be a problem and it wasn't so what I did is I chucked it up on the piston and I got it into the receiver tube and I um, worked it through all the different slots let's just do it now remember this has been in and out of the gun several times it's pretty much broken in from doing it so it's not like it was when it was brand spanking new and when we get done the build I'm going to pop a new one in and we'll be ready to go but it looks like this. Um, I grabbed the seal with my two fingers, thumb and finger, and it has this notch here. And remember, the R10 has the threaded plug in, see? So you got to go th all through that, plus the scope rail slot as well. So I just rolled it in, and I squeezed the top of the piston, and I got her in there. And then, of course, you work your way up to that, and you have to stick your little screwdriver just so it tucks in till you get to the hole. And it looks like this. Now I am underneath and inside, so at this point I'm gonna work it up. Remember, I'm inside the threaded area. And now we are currently underneath here. So we gotta tuck ourselves underneath that as well. Making sure that the piston's fairly straight. And then we're going to go for it and also watching the cocking slots so you don't slice your fingers squeezing it and now we're past it and we're just tucked underneath of it now i'm going to work it in again by hand so we get to this part and there we are we're ready to get underneath that one we'll just come up a wee bit closer just underneath of it like that 
and push it in. Again, the cock and slot, move your hand out of there. It'd be nice to wear one of those, and I have them. Let's uh, squeeze that and get it in there. I have them right here. These are good to work with under situations like that. Um, the Milwaukee Glip Work Gloves. So now we just have to get down in here. Of course, we have our buttons, too, that are gliding on those threads. Now, once you get in this part, as far as your piston seal is concerned, once you get out of here and into here, the diameter changes. It's not going to be exactly the same. And it can also change down in here. So let me get this ready. i got to get it a little closer, and then I can tuck it in. And we're tucked in. Now, with that... The piston's in, and she's snug as a bug. Now, she's not brutally tight. Obviously, you can see by the way I'm working it back and forth. I'm doing this for you. Again, we're going to have a different piston seal. So, at this point, we know we have a good seal that we can work. And um, normally, you would take, put the gun all together. This is what I do. And I'll cock, and I'll pay attention to the cock, and I'll shoot it probably around 20 times. And I space the shooting out so I don't overdo it and get anything going on as far as temperature-wise inside the air chamber. And then I see when I take the gun apart if it feels a little bit easier. If it does, I may just leave it as it is, or I may opt to take some of the seal face down at that point. And that's pretty much what we found in this gun here. And that's the way it goes, you know. You have to find things out on your own to see what works. Anyway, um, the piston was fine. The stem wasn't crooked, wasn't loose. That's great. I had to get the sleeve out of here because the top hat came off. But we straightened that mess out thanks to our Baron washer. One of the things I found in the gun was the um, breech seal. Let's talk about that. You know, the breech seal in this particular gun was all smashed over, flattened out, and had a big crack in it. It was the typical old school Viroc breech seal. But that told me that we had an issue going on with the breech. And that's why the seal was smashed. And it's because the seal stuck up too high. So which is it? Is it the breech block and the depth? Or is, was the seal made too much and it was sticking up too high? Now you might say, Mike, that's typical. And I'll say, yeah, it is typical. But I also had a lot of Viroc guns where the seal was just as good, no issues, no problem. I used to take them out and actually save the good ones and put them aside. And I would give them to some of the air gunners who asked me for them and every now and then checking in with me. And some of those guys shot competition and they would use them. So let's talk about that breech seal real quick. The breech seal is one of the most overlooked items on an air rifle. Everybody gets busy with pellets and scopes and God knows what else. But if that breech seal isn't in properly, it'll cause you to have a shift in the point of impact. Every time you shoot, you'll have a point of impact shift. And the reason why is when you close that barrel, depending on the power of the gun, depending on the material of the seal, and if it's in there and it's not right, you now have this going on inside that gun. You have a big pressure tight nest going on and they're fighting each other. And then when you shoot that gun, the shock, <clears throat> shock, shock wave of energy goes through and it'll cause that barrel block to shift. Now it's no different if you have a seal that's not tight enough and say you're leaking air. I think you all know, or most of you know, that you'll take a tissue piece like that, you'll load the pellet in, you'll cock the barrel, put the piece in there and close it up in there and you'll shoot it. And if you get tissues snowing up and out of there and blowing all over the place, uh, even if it's a little bit, then you know you have a leak on your seal and you'll get a point of impact shift. So all in all, it's the jam and the breech seal that work together as a team to do a job. Now, unfortunately, when you get into this hobby or sport, everybody, you know, we all go there. We've all been there. You can go online and buy your stuff and put all your stuff in a row. 
and then when you get it you um, methodically go through your gun you don't even think you just do and this could be one of the seals that you put in I, I used to put them in and take the good Viroc seals out but when you get further into this you become more acquainted with the house wise and and all that you'll say to yourself why am I using that first of all it's as hard as a stone now I'm not saying it doesn't work I'm saying in the wrong condition uh, position or condition that's going to cause an issue it's not really a, an acceptable seal in my book now why would they make that seal that's a good question well because it's easier for them it got something that they wanted to get done now they can move on to the other things that they have to take care of it was easy for them they can spit them out 300 at a time and then that'll be good for a couple months but at any rate um, what's good for them doesn't mean it's best for you it's just what's out there and um, that's the way it is but you do have a nice seal here it's kind of like clearish white now look it's at least you can squeeze it at least it has some suppleness to it you know, you know everybody's ready always uh, afraid to to talk about the truth in air guns it's just ridiculous it is what it is people are in business they do things what's good for them and when we're there the chips fall it, they fall how many times you buy piston seals and guess what they really were not all that well we don't want to get into that because we are thankful for the two vendors that are out there but this is a Viroc seal and you know what you can squeeze it it's nice it has a, some suppleness to it so this under the right conditions is going to give you a nice squish squeeze and bite at the same time so that it keeps everything together when the jam and, and the barrel blocks close with no issues and that would give you less of a chance of having a problem if it's stuck up too high so there it is breach seal information now if you look at this particular seal if you ask me um, I see a lot of them come out like that but that looks a little like it's too high to me so the main thing is to find out um, on your own and check it out if you don't have a problem that's good then go with it so there it is little little stuff on the breach seal now I'm going to cut the camera and I'm going to go to another take well, as far as the internals of the gun, all the lubes were dried up. And then when I cleaned the receiver up, I looked in there and I saw that it was really, really nicely crossed hatched. And it made me wonder who did it. Now, as far as lubes go, in the old days, the tuners went out, or the guys that worked with air guns, um, they really got into this stuff and they sought out what was the best method to put this stuff all together for a good functioning air rifle that will last and they came up with the molly lube and the number one the molly lube was good for metal metal to contact and you had that with the res receiver and the piston sliding back and forth and also they could take the molly and mix it with some oil of different sorts and then they could change the consistency of it and then use that on your fork washers with your uh, your forks and your washers and different other areas and so far that was looking pretty good and then they they realized okay well it needs to be burnished into the metal it doesn't just get slapped in there so they figured all that out and eventually they got to the point where they they decided well let's let's take this molly and cross hats the receiver tube and that's basically crisscrossing lines kind of like in an x pattern really um fine scored lines inside the tube and that way when they burnish the molly in it gets it gets hunkered down in the nooks and crannies and they felt that that was a good application you know cross hatching used in many other things too but that's where they got the idea from so so far so good with the molly back then it really seemed to do an air gun um, give it what it needed but we don't live in those times anymore and we have newer lubes available now there aren't that many air gunners out there who like to think outside of the box now i'll tell you tom from vortec is one of them and when he made those custom guides that were different than the normal typical spring guide I'm pretty sure he heard a lot of guff over that 
and air guns today need people to think outside of the box not get stuck in molds and i'll be very honest with you when i got into air guns i was one of the guys that was stuck in a mold I went by the old school tuners book and this is what you did and God forbid if you veer off of that well learned some things since then and I also grew up a little bit more and I too went out and stood on my own two feet with some other people and they went out and discovered you can indeed use different lubes so you need to think out of the box and um, try to find things out on your own but one of the things I found out is um, I came across a synthetic lube. I've tried many of them, and this stuff uh, won me over. Nothing wrong with Molly. I'm just saying there's other lubes you can use. Now, this is a synthetic grease. If you see the word grease there, it's not going to blow up in your air chamber. It's synthetic. Now, it's extreme pressure, multi-duty complex, high temperature grease. But like any lube that you're going to use, you need to know how to use it including the molly so they would burnish the molly in a tube they would cross hatch it that's the way they did it and they could use it for other things and it worked out pretty good now it was interesting because you would think why would they cross hatch that tube why wouldn't you leave that air chamber pristine or at least as pristine as it can be so when the piston seal comes down it rides on the side walls creating the pressure that it needs to create in order for it to heat up for the gun to fire properly but it could be because well they weren't really interested in speed back then and it would still work in an air rifle so in other words if they did do the cross hatch and they weren't going to lose enough air because of it with the uh, escaping air going around it of course well they knew they can get away with it but that's what they came up with so it depends on what you find uh, how you use it. Now my lube, if I didn't mention it, gets burnished into the steel also. So there it is, a little thing on the lubes. Now as far as the trigger goes, that was all dried up as well. Um, you know, when they put this in, they glob it in there. There's nothing wrong with that. I used to do the same thing. And then when you start using the trigger from the first time it's in the factory and test it, whatever's in the way just gets pushed out to the side and it eventually dries up. Now this is a record trigger. They work outstandingly. I really like them. And it worked just fine with dried lube in it. But now I, I took this aside and I had it soaking for at least a minimum of four days before I was able to get to it, waiting for parts in the mail. And then when I did, I just poked and prodded around down in there and to get everything out that was uh, hanging on for dear life. And I just bought a uh, ultrasonic cleaner it's sitting over there in a box. So it would have been nice to have that. It would have been cool to see how that worked. But meanwhile, when I was done all that and I used the brake cleaner spray, um, I used some weapon shield with a needle dropper and I was able to get in there in all these different areas and really get it in there good. You know, weapon shield is fantastic stuff. You, most people won't like it because it migrates everywhere and it's messy and that's why I love it. So I basically cleaned up whatever excess mess was going on from the weapon shield and when I was all done, I used my nice pasty synthetic lube on all the sear points and meanwhile all through all that i was just working it and firing it and so there it is the, the record trigger that works even with dry lube now works nice again nice and smooth now there are going to be guys out there that want to take this apart they're going to want to buff every little part they're going to want to see the reflection of their combed hair in it and that's fine that's because that's what they like to do that gets them a certain high and uh, that's there's nothing wrong with that but if you find yourself where you don't go that far that didn't mean you didn't do the job right there's nothing wrong with doing what we just did the trigger pretty much is working great the way it is so you take care of it that way and you'll be hunky-dory as well i was surprised to see that this had the little tab there that you bend back they used to bend it back a little bit and it would push the trigger back to take some of the travel out because i had an old r1 that somebody sent to me that had the old screw in type plug and the reason they sent it to me is because it didn't have that tab and it got on his nerves so bad he couldn't take it 
and he asked me can you please look at this trigger and come up with some type of thing to mod it to take away some of the travel and I said all right well send it over I'll take a look at it and I came up with a mod for it and it turned out really good um, I think those videos are still on YouTube somewhere there's a sequence of how it looks after the mod as well as a sequence of uh, what I actually kind of did I did a mock-up of it now this trigger is nice uh, if you're working on it at your kitchen table or your shop bench if it's in that position and you get um, uh, distracted need to get up go somewhere and you carry it in your hand be very careful because you can lose one of those rollers in that position and you'll be rolling around on the floor looking for it um, other than that it's just an outstanding trigger it really speaks for itself most people know those triggers are fantastic now the end plug has the safety and down at the bottom there where the safety slides back and forth it looks like a channel just like that so on the, on the bench i had the gun and i was uh, clean that slot out because all the loops were dried in it and that's why your safety doesn't work a lot of times on those older guns and I was just working it back and forth looking at it and turning it and everything felt and seemed okay but when I was cycling the gun working out the piston seals uh, it felt a little catchy so I took some 400 grit on my punch and I worked the slot down there at the bottom looks like that and I just worked it the side walls and then the middle track and it seemed to make it a little bit better I think I'm going to take this trigger here and then smooth this out a little bit maybe something in there is causing an issue now these things can get scarred up the face of your end plug and that's because well the guides metal and it rubs rubs on there all every time you shoot it and eventually you can get kind of scarred up well there's plenty of meat there right in front of the threads you'll see the nice bevel um, so if you have somebody with a lathe um, you can get them to face that off for you just take a nice light pass and you'll be back to square one with a nice beautiful finish for your spring guide to ride on well I guess you see that the um, pistons been buttoned um, I don't know if I talked about getting this sleeve out so let's work our way into that the sleeve's going to be a sitting in that gun for a long time and they do use lube when they put them in naturally but the lube's going to be all dried up so give yourself a break and go get the wd-40 that's what it's made for penetrating fluid i got into plumbing business when i was a young guy i used to use that every day when we worked in the plants so <clears throat> you want to saturate your piston sleeve through the slot watch it wick in saturate it again when you know you've got it pretty darn good get cleaned up and walk away and let that do its job don't be in a hurry let it take the time to let it do its job then when you come back you'll be able to pull that out of there now the bottom of that slot you'll see one of these notches it'll look like a hole but it's really just a notch grab your angle pick now if you don't have a bench vise um, you know they do come in handy but you got to be careful with your bench vise right you don't want to get carried away you can take it to the side of the table tap this angle pick in your notch but be aware of your rod so tap it in get it at least halfway in but then keep your hand out of the way right you can go over to your table and go to your edge um, where you'll have this clearance here you'll have this halfway in hold this nice and firm now your hands out of the way right anything happens your hands not going to get hurt and then you hold it firm and, and get ready and lose your body weight and go down smoothly and even to yank that down at least to the tabletop and this much here you should be able to finish the rest off by holding your hand behind it but if you keep your hand in there and do that and this thing slips you're going to tear your fingers or your thumb wide open and then when you get it out and go to put it back later you're going to need to clean this up and also inside the piston because all that dry lube is just going to play havoc with it and i had to do the same thing and then you just want to get some oil on your fingers so whatever you got a nice thin thin coating of oil couple drops in here wipe it back and forth with the q-tip just so it's not dry metal to metal and then when you go back 
if it's this type of piston remember you got your slot back there so line the slot with the slot when you put it in you can go and put your bearing washer in after you're done what you want to do is just <clears throat> make sure um, the slot end is with the slot end and you get it all set up start to tuck it in work it way in there a little bit when you get it in there a certain point right then you can just take your spring without the top hat on it um, and then push it back like that and then you'll be all lined up and this hole should show where it was originally and that's how you put it back but a little bit of lubrication to take it out and put it back will do wonders so as far as the piston goes i like to basically do barren rings but it's a virock and i don't wouldn't uh, i wouldn't say do a barren ring on a virock first of all the piston's thin and i'm very picky if i'm going to do bearing rings and i do do them on the hats and magnums when i work a hats and i include it on the package deal i will uh so you can see how thick that piston is plenty of room to do it plenty of depth you can there's no problem there and even if i wanted to above the slot here there's an area to go between the stamp and, and the slot area but i wouldn't want to do that on a hatson now on the virock it's thin if you took that measurement and divided it in half and went to your lathe and bored that out to that diameter or thickness um, that didn't work for me i didn't like it and i wouldn't go for it now i know there's a guy on youtube and he does the baron rings on these uh, virock pistons but i don't agree with them because like i said i don't like the thickness of the baron ring but he also goes down into the stamp slot areas and the pinned area now if you don't know those stampings are there because that's what holds this button on right it's inserted and they press stamp it and that holds the button and then you have the little pin that goes all the way through and it holds the rod as well as the spline that's pressed fit in there and i just don't think it's a good idea to go in that area now he hasn't had a problem that's fine but to my liking that's a no-no so as far as our buttons concerned our piston was the old-fashioned one it's wedged up in the back and then we took some of that down we turned it down with our lathe and then we proceeded to drill our butt for our holes for our buttons and that's what they look like I don't know if you can see them or not and that's pretty pretty straightforward so where are we we are almost done now we know we can have a piston seal that didn't belong in the gun we can either take it down a little bit or leave it for a um, longer break in period the choice is yours well don't forget your cock and arm you know that's another thing it could use some tlc on a magnum spring there's a lot of tension on that pin all right well this ain't a magnum but it still could use some tlc don't be afraid to make sure that it's thoroughly lubricated a lot of guys do things that really annoy me they may try to get a little oil down there because they don't want to make a mess as it keeps weeping back out i say bully saturate that area make sure the pin gets enough in there that it's done done not a guessing game and wipe it off as it drips out right you can even get your air compressor after that and blow some of it out of there at least you know it's saturated and it's inside and it's all done but either way make sure it gets done 110 percent may seem stupid but uh you know it's part of your air gun now we're almost towards the end so now you have your jam you know on a hatson i tell the guys to push that jam in to take the tension off the pin and pull the pin out and the spring and the jam but this is a virock right you don't have to do that because number one the hole's not oversized and there's not going to be junk in there it's fine machined german steel it has a nice precision hole you don't need to do that but if you want you can take some penetrating fluid since it's a vintage rifle give it some tlc let it weep down in there wipe off the excess don't go overboard and then um 
that would be good for a little bit of lubrication going on inside there if you didn't do it what would happen well nothing I'm just saying you have a choice you can put some lubrication in there and call it a day but you don't want to overdo it because you don't want it to roll back and get into the breech area when the gun's laying down or whatever it's doing so keep in mind how you do that but a little TLC isn't going to hurt now one thing I did catch on this gun it didn't have the star nut at the barrel because it's a vintage gun but it did have the pin let's see if I can find that pin for you yes there it is now i'm going to see if you can see it let me get my little pointer by now only the old school viroc dudes are liking this video so let's see if we can't get you in there let's see where are we here right in front of my punch you may or may not be able to see the pin uh, circle for the barrel pin Now, right there, it looks like you can. I'm going to wing it back just a wee bit. I saw it, Mike. I saw it. That stuff turns me on. Anyway, uh, so they were pinned in, in, in that particular time that they made the guns. Well, I think we covered it pretty good here. So a lot of good information. There's a couple more clips. If you can still hang in there, I'll show you how to take this out, how to put it back how to put the record trigger in, and also information on the sliding scope rail. See you in the next clip. The very last clip, we're going to do the crony numbers. You're going to want to stick around for that. Maybe make some more popcorn. Thanks for hanging out. All right, it's time for the crony numbers. There's what we're using here, the JSBs. 13.73 grain Diablo, 0.20 cal. We're doing really good, actually. Um, I did put a new Blue Hornet seal in. Like we talked about, we would take the one we were working during our gun, but then I decided to take it down at the last minute, and I really don't like doing that. And the result was a total failure. So I got another Blue Hornet seal, because I have some of them here, and um, put it in the gun. And because it... Uh, and because it was a snug fit, we're going to go with it. Now, just because you can't push that piston back and forth with, with a sticky tacky ease, doesn't mean that spring can't. And it's not going to do any harm to the receiver or whatever way you lube that up. I don't know where that idea came from that you have to have it a slight sticky tacky. Um, the idea is to get a good piston seal that does a job. Now, I'm really surprised at these uh, results because I would expect a little bit less than what we're getting for my elevation. And I'm being in a cool basement as well, 3,100 feet above sea level. Nice and smooth, no rattle and nothing. Absolutely wonderful. Now, if you want to hang in, I got clips on how to take the end of the receiver off, how to put it back with a little bit of ease. Sometimes they can be a pain as well as putting the record trigger in and save you some headache for the new guys that are coming around the block. Thanks for hanging out. Okay, this is what it's going to look like to get this out in a nice manner. So I'm pretty set up. I'm strapped down. Um, there is a little bit of play there, but we're okay with that. Um, I do it like this. Now this particular spring compressor I made is very very crude and I love it because I can do anything with it so I am I got a piece of foam on the end of the barrel what we do when we unscrew it, it we're screwing into this but there's that creates tension because it's pushing the barrel and the whole receiver into a piece of foam and that's fine but the you have to have just enough tension to where when you finally get out here it doesn't spray or spring all over now the pin goes into the slotted holes that the other your punch goes into the slotted holes that the pins were in. It's going to look like this. And the parallel holes that are right there, they're the tapped ones. Tell yourself they're the ones you stay out of. Because if you're not paying attention, you're going to space it out 
and then shame on you if you mess up a nice vintage rifle um, for not taking the time to think it through so we're almost there I got tension here and uh, we're gonna pop it out I'm gonna wee back a wee bit more because I got a wee bit too much trying to make sure we get this into the film let's see here And see that we're already out and nobody nobody even knew it okay so we're out please wear a glove at least if you're if, if, if this is the hand you're going to be holding this with wear a glove so now to put it back this is what I do I'm going to get this back make sure that my um, top hat is not taken my thrust washer with it which it certainly is trying to do now this is what's going to save you a big headache take your end when you got to put it all back screw it in there now this spring compressor see i can go up and down i can go all kinds of different things so i screw this in just to get to where this is stable and i know where this is going to want to sit for the height and i have a piece of foam and i'll stick it under there and then i'll work my shims right So pretty much right there is where the foam is going to want to be in order to do its job. Now that'll really help you out when you go to stick this back, believe me. We can take the foam out of the way. All right, let's get the... guy back in there, put the foam down, get our end plug. Let me just check. I wasn't even checking to see if we're in on the camera right now. All right. I'm just trying to rush on the why, but uh, I feel, realize this film is just going so long. But it's, you know what? There's a lot of info here. Now, I'm going to put the glove on, wipe this lube off my hand, put my glove on. And then we are going to go in for the kill. Now this guy's been in and out of here, so initially it's a little tighter than that, but this thing's been in and out of the gun so many times you wouldn't believe it. Now to put it back simply, I'm going to have some tension, and because we have a bevel in front of those threads, the more tension I put on there, it's almost self-centering that. Now again, these two holes, I don't know if they're on camera, but we want to stay out of the ones that are parallel with each other. And then I'll begin to turn this. And I can tell you already, we're actually caught, which is nice. Now, if you've worked on these guns, I can tell you, you know what I'm talking about. You can sit here, and it was driving me nuts, and I was, I've had this gun apart so many times because we're working. That's the thing with a vintage gun, you're going to be working it. It's not going to be, well, we just put the seal in there, and then, nah, nah, nah. no, you're doing, you're actually being put to work. You're, you are figuring out what works, what doesn't work, what obstacles you're coming up against, the whole nine yards, and then you're making decisions along the way. Now, the good thing was with these piston seals is uh, somebody uh, knew that they were going to use the seal that didn't belong in the gun, and we got to where we needed to go. We didn't just stick to what somebody said. We found out on our own. And I can't stress that enough in this sport. A lot of guys ask me questions, and I often wonder why they don't try to find things out on their own, because it's not like some of the things they ask me about are very hard to find out. It's almost like they're lazy. Same thing with breed seals. Buy a bunch of them and do some testing sand the bottom of it down put it in see when it's going to fail see how the lockup feels do some stuff but anyway now you got it in you can actually turn it by hand to where you want it and then you'll come into where you just line yourself up with the other channel and it looks like that where are we I don't know if you can see that or not. But anyway, that's pretty good. And, and then just double check. You can undo it again and then roll back up into it slowly. 
um, you know, because you want to be dead on. So when you go to put your scope reel on, you'll be a okay and pretty close to where you need to be. And then you can put your scope reel on. Let's do that real quick. One scope rail coming up. Ah, where's my piece of foam? We're missing a piece of foam. Foam overboard. Oh, the Pro Elite down here is hiding it. It says, Mike, when are we going to have our turn? We've been sitting here waiting now. Now, my uh, spring compressor is very crude, and I love it. Okay, so we're pretty much set to go with the scope rail and screws. It's already been lubed. You want to lube the bottom of your scope rail. And um, give me a second, let me get a Q-tip. You want to make sure your threads and your screws are cleaned off. And don't use any type of lube that's going to dry like a rock. I had fish and tackle lube in those threads. And brother, they gave me a heck of a time anyway there's your dovetail right so there's your dovetail on that everything's been ready to go lubed up drop your dovetail in and then when you're in you can slowly slide it back and take your time so you can ease into watching your holes when everything seems to be lining up properly and that looks pretty darn good to me now if it's not lined up just a little bit, you won't be able to get that screw in. She's going to fight you. So let's see where we are with this. That one's good. That means we're pretty darn looking good. Now, I don't know if I mentioned it, but the bottom of the screws underneath the head are beveled, and so is the screw, uh, so is the screw hole on the scope rail. So the screws going down, when they get close, will self-center everything. Shift that plate exactly where it needs to be if it's slightly off. So basically take the screws down to when they bottom out. And then push down hard and give it a turn, a snug. Don't go beyond, don't go beyond ballistic, please. But the main thing is be careful of the lube you put on there. I, I wouldn't even mind using weapon shield or any type of lube from Lucas, uh, but um, you know, or synthetic lube is good too. But man, who would have thought the fish and tackle lube that they used would have been a nightmare after years that it dried up? And there it is in a nutshell. Now we can put the trigger back, but I have another sequence on that. And also, I mentioned that the trigger. I said it was catchy. I, I looked over the trigger block very careful. And I went down there real carefully and I caught something right down here. I don't know if you can see it. I doubt it. I'm just trying to show you. And I took my Dremel and I fine sanded it smooth. It was a little dig in to that corner piece of metal, smoothed it out, and now the safety feels a lot better. Thanks for hanging out. I hope you learned something. Let's go to a clip if there's any clips left. Okay, we're we are almost there. I'm almost on my final turn, and so you just ease up into it, line it up. You could even unline it and then line back up to it till the seam totally lines up together. So let's go put the trigger in. Now that's real easy. Um, obviously, you want the trigger to be set, so this is how you set it. Of course, it's done. And you'll grab your safety with the spring on it right you can see that stick that in your safety hole and what you're going to want to do it's real simple it's not complicated uh, this trigger will actually be on a slight angle by the time these holes line up with the pinholes so you want to hold your safety in push it in all the way <clears throat> make sure your rollers are even with your jacket so they're not sticking out a little bit and then of course you always oil this a little bit now i have oil on here and this is just a rough pass um, this gun's going to be taken apart again so i just line it up with the pinhole on the way down where the where the pin and the roller goes and i take a look to see how it looks and i'm, I'm still holding the safety in and i had to tilt the trigger just like we talked about to get it up a little bit now the easy part is use your punch 
stick your punch in there hold this part so don't move now that the punch is through your safety's in there you're going to have to choose the proper pin and the one closest to the top is going to be the shorter one just push the punch out of the way with your pin and you'll have your roller pin in and then take a peek on the next one you may have to jostle it around to get it in if it's if it's off a little bit and there you'll um put the next pin in by pushing the punch out just that simple and then don't forget to fire it and then your safety will work when you go to cock the gun and load the pellet and all that that's pretty much it so you'll be able to look through the holes and that'll tell you okay we need to come this way a little bit more then use your proper size punch to line it and keep your alignment all right see you on the next clip